being to address non-traumatic dental pain presentations with the following goals of establishing effective intake, treatment, and discharge protocols, minimize the use of opioids and opioid prescribing, and direct patients to definitive treatment for emergent oral health issues. And as Lisa mentioned, this was done in the Madison-Dane County area. So this is where the inception of the project began. And then finally, it was developed um, in February of 2015 where the actual program was initiated. So this is no surprise to anybody on the call that oral health is critical to overall health and that there's growing awareness and research on the relationships between oral infections and diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, low birth weight, preterm babies. As a matter of fact, the last time I checked, and Bobby may even have more information on that, there was 57 to 60 medical comorbidities that were um, basically being linked to being researched between oral health and other medical systems. So in the process, we wanted to develop an intake protocol. So that entailed creating effective systems for triaging patients into the proper care, minimize the number of people coming into the emergency rooms and urgent care centers who don't need to be there, and then reduce and or eliminate the amount of opioid prescribing being dispensed from the ED and urgent care departments. This is an example it was from our, our third pilot um, group that we've just started working with of basically their triage protocol that was set up. So you can see United Way is actually serving as our community dental care coordinator. And we're working with two hospital, actually probably three hospital systems in Northwestern Wisconsin, which is Amory, Cumberland, and then we're also going to be working with Marshfield Systems as well in that area. And North Lake Community Clinics is the FQHC that we're working with currently as basically the care site. We're hoping to expand that, but as we all know with COVID and other issues, it's been slow going process. But to, I don't want to necessarily read through everything, but quickly the emergency department provides the patient with the referral card and has the patient call the eat from the ED. Now, sometimes what they'll do is, you know, depending on the time and the busyness of the ED or urgent care, a staff member at the emergency department may be able to initiate that call for the patient. Then the patient will receive a call back from the community dental care coordinator within one business day. So for example, we know a lot of emergencies happen Friday night through the weekend. Well, obviously, that the uh, United Way may be closed, but they do have an answering service. So they will check back with that patient on the following Monday or Tuesday at the latest. The CDCC identifies barriers to access and immediate needs, gets the patient's information, and then they release the information to the North Lake Clinics. They also will assist and help with the, the member to try to address some of the barriers such as transportation, housing, insurance, and again, try to eliminate and prevent no-shows, et cetera. And the patient calls North Lakes to arrange the appointment. Now, the other critical factor that is involved with these care coordinators is the follow-up. So they will follow up both with the clinic and the patient after a certain time frame. And it could be 72 hours or earlier, depending on what is decided in the community. That way we can assess if the treatment was performed, if the patient was able to get to the appointment. And if not, how can we mitigate those risks going forward and correct that situation or scenario? This is just the same shameful plug of our new logo for the project. So <laughs> I had to put that in and this was developed primarily by Dr. Dave Gunderson and uh, individual that he's working with on an IT. This is just a brief snapshot that I wanted to bring up. Back in 2018 in the La Crosse County area, who is now our second pilot site that we've been working with, there was approximately 885 non-traumatic dental pain visits to the ED and urgent cares in that area. 
The other thing that's key to notice is that at that time, approximately one third or 32 to 33 percent of the individuals leaving the ER our urgent cares were receiving an opioid prescription. I can tell you the date now, especially with Gunderson Hospital and the Cross, that percentage is down to 1% or less. Where they And they are also initiating or sending home with the patients blister packs with both ibuprofen and acetaminophen dose prepackaged for them to help aid the patients in dealing with their pain rather than having to rely on opioid prescribing. And when we do the training with the ED staff, et cetera, with the hands-on training, both Dr. Gunderson and I go over reasons why, and also using the Cochrane report, the, T the TETA report as well, as to why it's more effective to actually be using the ibuprofen and acetamin combinations rather than the narcotics. This, um, we do have more recent data. Unfortunately, I was not able to put it in, into a PowerPoint, but either myself or even Lisa can um, provide a little update toward, at the end here if we need to, looking for more information. We do have data from both Madison, Dane County, and La Crosse. We don't have anything from Northwest because we just initiated that program, so they really don't have that much information or data to share currently. Here's another important point that we develop. We develop uh, an algorithm sheet that's two-sided and this we work with the communities involved. So we work with the emergency departments and the coalition to develop this algorithm to fit your needs. So this is just a template of showing what this looks like. But for example, if you look at the bottom, we can change the non-opioid pain control it doesn't have to be set in stone that it's 400 milligrams of ibuprofen and 1,000 milligrams of acetaminophen. We work with the individual groups within the community to decide what we want to do. Same thing with the timing, you know, that the patient sees the dentist within three days. Some communities, it's been 24 to 48 hours. Again, we work with the systems locally and design this specifically for the hospital systems in the area. And it's two-sided. So this side we work with and changing a lot. The second side, the only part that's really set in stone is this, this first part right now for online resources. The reason being is Dr. Joe Best and myself, along with several others and DHS and Marquette University, developed a webinar that can be used for the ED staff prior to us doing the hands-on training. What the timestamp is involved for is because we know how busy the ED staff is and how tough it is to sit down and watch an hour and 30 or hour and 45 minute webinar. This gives them the timestamp of where to go for their specific needs prior to our doing our hands-on training with each individual hospital. And then this is the link for that actual webinar. The rest, as we said, the local anesthetic guide, pain control guidance, and infection control guidance, we can work with, again, the individual groups to see if there's specific changes that we feel need to be made for that. So this, liver, this literally serves as a living document. This does get laminated. So, and then it also gets put into something we provide called the Badger Box or Tooth Pain Box. Within that box, it contains local anesthetic, dental syringes, topical anesthetic, and a place to actually put that laminated algorithm sheet for quick reference. Now, so for example, in the lacrosse system, what they've done with the algorithm is they've actually downloaded it now on their Epic system so that they can just pull it up with their computer system. Um, but this gives people a, an opportunity. It's much easier to do dental blocks using these dental anesthetic syringes. For those of you who have worked in the either the emergency department or the OR and have used medical syringes to do dental blocks, I can tell you firsthand, having worked in the operating room for 30 plus years, it's very difficult to do a dental injection using a medical syringe because you can't aspirate unless you're doing a two-handed technique and you really can't be doing a two-handed technique when you're doing an, an intraoral block. It's just very difficult to do. So, and that I can attest to firsthand. 
Then we jump into the training. Um, uh, this is yours truly over here. And then this is Dr. Gunderson. And then the, this is Debbie Denour. Um, Dr. Gunderson and Dr. Denour, um, then Debbie Denour, along with Lisa, are three of the individuals that initiated or started with the protocol project back in 2014, 2015. So um, Dave and I, and then have Debbie as well when she's available, actually go in and do the hands-on training to the individual staff. So you can see, you know, we first we go over dental anatomy and landmarks hands-on with the staff as they show up. But then down here, this is an electronic mannequin that is actually can be used to give positive feedback. It can actually give three different injections, what's called the left mandibular and the right mandibular block. And then you can also do an infraorbital or infiltration block which would be on the upper right side around the canine area. What happens is, is when you go in and do that injection, it will actually, when you hit the right spot, it will give you, it will give a positive sound. And also a green light will show up on the top part here to let you know that you're actually in the right spot. So it gives you a nice positive feedback that you know you're close. And what I can also tell you after Dr. Gunderson and I and Debbie have worked with these mannequins, if you can hit the right spot on the mannequin, many times it's going to be easier actually to do it on an individual patient than it is getting it to, in the right spot on these mannequins. And this is just basically the um, webinar that I talked about that Dr. Best and I put together. I'm just going to briefly go through, this is just some slides in there where we go over PKA, and then I explain why the PKA is, a, is important, especially when we're dealing with highly infectious issues and you know, then what type of anesthetics we use, et cetera, going forward. Just reinforce the anatomy, et cetera. Sorry about going through this, but I wanna get to, and then it just goes, then the webinar goes through this. And then Dr. Best and I in the webinar as well, do a hands-on presentation within the webinar so that you can actually see that um, through the camera. And again, sorry for this. And then this is just another webinar that Dr. Best and I put together along with Lisa and other people in the Opioid Harm Protection Program that was for dentists regarding the opioid issue and dental pain management. And that's it from that standpoint. Um, Bobby, why don't I turn it over to you first and then we can answer questions together as needed by the group. That's great, thank you, Russ. And apologies if you hear the dull roar of Sesame Street in the background, my kid has the sniffles and <laughs> you can't go to school with the sniffles these days. So, um, so I think Russ, that was the perfect setup. And my role really here is I'm a physician improvement advisor with the hospital association. And so the idea is how do we get QI projects to actually happen? I think we've all had those experiences where um, you've got a great idea, you've got a great concept and then it falls flat for whatever reason or doesn't meet expectations. Um, and as an emergency physician, I'm a liaison with the emergency department. So um, everyone on the call, I'm, it's bobby.redwood at gmail.com. Please feel free to reach out. I'll give you my cell too if you have your pens. It's 217-493-1642. I'll put that in the chat, both of those. Um, but reach out with any needs whatsoever for dental issues and emergency physicians especially, um, because I think there's actually a lot of, um, there's a, a real powerful alliance here. These are undesirable um, visits for the patients and for the providers, not because, not because anyone's you know, um, mean-spirited or anything, but because our care system isn't designed for non-traumatic dental pain at four in the morning. So if you're a patient, you come in and because of our ED triage system, you're last in line and you're waiting three, four, five hours. And then we have a strong opioid stewardship effort throughout the state, which is appropriate, but you're, you're not getting opioid pain medications. You're getting ibuprofen and Tylenol, which you already had access to. Um, and then thanks to Russ and his crew, we're really disseminating the practice of dental blocks to try to add some value to that patient's ED experience. Um, but the, the real value is the care coordination. And anyone who's worked in the emergency department knows that while there's a goal of care coordination 24 seven, it's not there, right? You'll be lucky if you have a care coordinator from nine to five, usually there's no care coordinator at all. And that's a real mismatch between the community and expectations. People think that the ED is going to be able to set up follow-up visits and do all these kind of logical, easy things. And the reality is with the production pressures on the emergency providers and even the, the unit clerks or sec techs, that often gets backburnered or doesn't happen at all. 
Um, and so that's really a key part of this working is understanding each individual ED and what's the rub? How do we make this easy? This has got to be a staples button, not just for the patients, but also for the ED providers and for the ED unit clerks. That is how, you know, the ED coordinators and the ED unit clerks, that is how quality improvement um, efforts actually happen. Um, and so when we talk about the referral process, we want to audit those and make sure they're actually happening. Does the unit clerk have an EHR that supports the referral process? Um, is it clear to everyone? If it fell through the cracks, why did it fall through the cracks? Um, and that's part of the role that I play here is to make sure that these excellent concepts can actually be translated into process in not just any emergency department, but your emergency department specifically. Sometimes I'm dealing with physician resistance. So you get providers who say, I don't want to engage with this project. You know, that's, that's not uncommon with, for example, I do work with sepsis and that's kind of an unpalatable quality improvement project or, or stroke initiative. Sometimes physicians have issues with the science. That's not really the case with, um, with increasing access to dental care and a, a non-opioid approach to non-traumatic dental pain. The providers are really on board. Um, it's more about making it, making it easy, making it visible, um, and getting the process off the ground so that the providers can, can fly high and provide best care with the dental block, um, scheduled anti-inflammatories, as needed Tylenol, and then really follow up. Um, my other hat at WHA is uh, antimicrobial stewardship, and this is another prime area where we have alliance between physicians and, um, and dentists and the patients, really, is not providing antibiotics to non-traumatic dental pain that doesn't require it. So there's a lot of pseudo-infections out there or periodontal disease where the true treatment is extraction. It's not an antibiotic. And um, when patients come in time and time again for their amoxicillin or their penicillin, they will develop resistance, and that pushes community resistance. So I think that's my closing point here is when you have this program launched successfully, you also have a lot of successful work products that you can share with your quality improvement directors, you can share with your C-suite, you can share with your um, state legislators even, or your patient um, and family advisory councils, is that we are providing opioid stewardship um, to get fewer people their first taste of opioids and really um, work to combat the opioid epidemic. We are providing antimicrobial stewardship um, to prevent superbugs and multidrug resistant organisms. We're obviously preventing dental disease with early access to care. Um, and as Russ stated, there, the comorbidities related to dental disease are just vast and real. Um, and then especially during this era of COVID, we are freeing up emergency department resources at a time when this precious resource has never been more constrained. Um, so that's the summary. I think we really should have good alliance with, with providers, with emergency department staff, and with patients, and obviously with our dental colleagues. Um, and the real, the real rubber meets the road is when you're in an emergency department, how do you get this to work? And so everyone on this call, that's, I'd like you to reach out to me if you're having issues, if you're having struggles, certainly any provider resistance. But like we got to get in the weeds. What is it? Is it the dental box isn't stuffed? Is it the badger box is tucked in the closet some way? Is it your electronic record health record doesn't have the right um, you know orders for for follow up? Whatever it is, that's where we can really get into the weeds and make it work for you. Um, and we want to offload you. We want. I know everybody has a lot of competing demand, so I'm here to make your lives easier, to make your providers' lives easier, um, and then the. Um, my, my dental colleagues dental block training is usually really well received by emergency physicians. Um, for some physicians, it's been a gap in their residency training. They didn't learn regional anesthesia in the first place. Um, and for many of us, we're dusting off the cobwebs. We haven't used all of these blocks recently and we're always looking for a chance to get more sophisticated. So thanks to Russ and your team for helping us get more sophisticated. Um, I'll fade now, always open for questions and then I'll put my contact info into the uh, chat box. Thanks, Bobby, and thanks for jumping into the antimicrobial stewardship issue, because along with everything else, I'm also on the Wisconsin State Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee, and we just we just provided last year for until we created the dental antimicrobial tool stewardship toolkit. So that is available as well, free of charge, and that's on the DHS website. So Michael, what we'd like to do is open it up for any questions that, I know we I ran through that pretty quickly, so <laughs> apologies for that. Um, well, I know I have lots of questions and I hope this will spark other questions as well. Um, 
I, we've got great partners. And from what I understand with um, Bellin, HSHS, and Aurora, you know, that represents the um, bulk of our hospital emergency care. Um, I don't know what status we're at with some of these things and where our hospital providers refer. Um, I think we're trying to work on that. Um, so maybe some of you hospital folks can, can talk about that. But I guess the um, question for you all is, rubber meets the road. How did you get buy-in from the hospitals to change their referral process? Because that's, I think, something that we're, we're looking at. Well, one of the things that I can say um, was the frustration, and I know Dr. Redwood would be able to back me up on this completely, is when we started meeting with the ED physicians, their frustration with not having anywhere to send the patients that were presenting in their ED department. So they, you know, they, as, as I actually a provider type, were very receptive to trying to come up with the system and protocol to find a, a way to get people into the definitive care that they need because you know other areas they didn't have a problem somebody came in with the cardiac issue or or the pedic issue they didn't have an issue really with finding someone to get to for the definitive care but with dental it was just a nightmare because the, the frustration was just extremely high so i can say that from a physician standpoint we really didn't get much resistance that I saw. And like Bobby had mentioned, when we've gone in and done the, the hands-on training, it's been extremely positive and very receptive by the ED staff and urgent care staff going forward with that. Bobby, do you have anything to add, do you think, on that? Russ, I totally agree. Um, the referral, pro so, and this is a common assumption that I think is, is part of the reason we're here is to clarify what really goes on in the emergency department. The usual referral is your dentist. I'm free texting into the discharge instructions, follow up with your dentist. Um, and that's obviously silly. Most patients don't have a dentist if they're already in the emergency department. And the, um, the patients who come, you know, like Russ said, Friday, Saturday nights, after hours, you know, it, they're, not, they're not the type of patients who have their smartphone and can Google all the local dentists. And, you know, I mean, they're something has already fallen through the cracks with this patient population for whatever reason, and they're reaching out for help. And we're not very good at helping them in the emergency department. And, um, you know, it's, this, again, this sounds ludicrous to people who don't work in the ED, but for the ED coordinators out, you know, there, it's hard for me sometimes to get a cardiologist on the phone, you know, like someone's having a heart attack and it's hard to get a cardiologist after hours, let alone actual real dental follow-up as opposed to a card or a list of dentists in the area. Um, and so I think that's the key to this is having a, um, a line, a real staff line where people actually follow up um, and, you know, don't give up if it doesn't work the first time and try again um, and offloading that work from the ED secretary or the ED physicians, because with the competing priorities and a busy emergency department, it just gets backburnered. That's just the reality of it. Um, and so I think that's the secret sauce. And I add on to that a little bit too, Michael, as, and Bobby had really hit home as well. And what, and the, a real key piece in this is the care coordination and the flexibility of where that key court or that care coordinator actually sits. For example, in La Crosse, the care coordinator was in the local health department. Um, as you saw in the Northwest, it's actually going to be with St. Croix United Way, the 211. In Green Bay, Fortunately, um, NEW, the FQHC there has agreed to serve as our dental care coordinator, as is what we were using a safety net clinic in the Madison Dane County area. Then the other issue is trying to find other dentists buy in. So that's where hopefully Dave Gunderson and I come in, where hopefully we're going to be doing a presentation next month in Green Bay to the Brown County Dental WDA Coalition for Component Society. And that's what we were able to do in La Crosse as well, is actually do a presentation to that dental group to try to get buy-in because we all know the pushback with Medicaid and the uninsured, but especially with Medicaid, getting Medicaid providers, that's been one of the issues as well that we're working on.
I'd be interested with the emergency service coordinators on the call from the Green Bay area. Um, what's your interpretation of the current landscape in terms of getting real dental follow-up for, for a patient who comes into the emergency department? Who would that be? Who knows some of our current situation in the hospitals? <laughs> David, Chris, uh, Bridget. Well, I was just going to say, I'll, I mean, to be honest, this is my first meeting. So I was kind of not as familiar with the info I need to kind of reach out to. I did talk to our um, ED medical director and he had mentioned that they, he felt like they still struggled um, getting referrals and things like that. So I do want to kind of do a little bit more digging now and kind of talking. We do have a, um, an RN case manager in our department um, that works specifically in the ED. So I, I think I really want to reach out to her and kind of see if she knows some barriers or any more that I have just not heard of. Because um, you know how that is, unless they tell me, I really don't know. Um, so I definitely, I think I'll be able to bring more back to the table next time, um, just with this being my first meeting, kind of not knowing what to expect. So. No, thank you for speaking up. And I, I totally understand. I put people on the spot, but I think that's part of the, the service that WDPP can offer too, is sort of stress test those existing um, referral processes, right? So there might be a referral process in, process in place, but is it actually working? How, what percentage of the time does it work? Is there an opportunity for enhancement there? I think we all know that there's gardens that need to be tended in our workflows. Um, and that, that's a possibility, right? Is that it's an untended garden. This could be an opportunity to strengthen it. Definitely. And I, yeah, I just think I need to kind of identify what our barriers are to be able to move forward. So I think that's, it's good. I know Wanda said there was a lot of work that was done previously. So I'm just kind of starting to dig in and find out where we're, where we're at specifically. And that's a good point with the work. If something's already existing, if it's working, we don't want to lose that. If, if there's a way to enhance it, that's great, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel either. If there's something that seems to be working within the community, let's figure out how to go with that or enhance it. Um, another question for you. So, you know, I feel like as a small dental provider, I, I guess I'm curious how your program might work. Like, can we get pilot here? Obviously, you're presenting to us today, making good contacts. You'll be presenting to the Brown County Oral Health, or sorry, the um, Brown Door Kiwani, it sounds like, Oral Dental Health Group. Um, but is there a way to invite you all in so that you are stress testing things or you are working with the hospitals? And you know, you know what I mean? You had these great pilot sites. How do we become one too? Because we're hugely important for Wisconsin in this area. Michael, are you looking more from an expansion process through the state? I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I can say, and it's a little, it's kind of an offshoot that I'm doing as the state dental director. I'm currently working with Medicaid um, and also the governor's health equity committee on trying to figure out how to expand the role of community dental care coordinator to where it would be a basically a sustainable provider type within the state. Now, this is separate from this actual project. So this is something that I'm doing separately with you know, both the Medicaid and the Governor's Health Equity Committee. So more to come on that. Specifically for this group, one of the things that, you know, one of the pushbacks we I've gotten a lot from dental providers other than the low reimbursement rates with Medicaid is the no-shows and the fact that their offices don't want to be inundated when they become a Medicaid provider of 30, 40 calls a day. They just can't handle that. That's one of the key pieces that the care coordinator actually helps because they maintain the list and literally try to literally spread it around so that the individual member 
they're actually trying to get to a provider that it's not always the same one. So that group isn't inundated. They try to help control the flow and also mitigate some of the problems that the member has in order to try to get to that appointment. So the, they basically have multiple functions within that. And even going forward, even though they're not community health workers, in the end game, they can actually be working with community health workers as well and try to mitigate those risks. And this specific project, of course, is geared towards emergency departments. So there's 154 hospitals in the state of Wisconsin. We'd love to hit them all, all at once, <laughs> um, but it's a grant-based project that builds year by year. Um, and we, we run the numbers essentially and triage the need um, based on multiple factors, including ED um, visits for non-traumatic dental pain, um, the extent of the opioid crisis, things like that. Um, but we're obviously hoping to continue to expand and reach every corner of the state. Um, mm -hmm. Hi, so I have a quick question. So yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, from a standpoint of uh, serving Brown County to its fullest, um, how do we how do we launch this in our area, you know, as NEW clinic has volunteered, uh, from what I'm understanding to start training people with your um, badger box and your algorithm sheet. Um, what would be suggested, like to train uh, the hospital staff, the emergency room staff, would it be like a quarterly training? Would it be a twice a year training just to get the ball rolling? Um, what would you recommend? Well, the training actually is not done by any W. They're serving as the coordinator piece. Okay. The hands-on training is actually done by myself, okay. Dr. Gunderson and Debbie Denor. And after we present to the Dental Society, if we can get engagement from dental providers as well. That's something we were successful in doing in La Crosse was we're actually able to engage some oral surgeons as well as the residency program there and some other private dentists um, in the private sector to help with us doing the training. So we would literally be doing the training to each individual hospital system. So we send them the, web, the webinar that I'd mentioned previously. So they have that on hand. And then we literally go in and do a hands-on training. Okay. So that, does that answer your question? Ben? Yes, yes. No, that helps. Thank you. Another thing that I, I think deserves clarification is that, um, so we, we have these pilots and the Green Bay area is one of the pilots that we are providing resources for. So typically when we set this up, we don't have the existing partnerships like you do here. It's one of the reasons why we thought you would be a great uh, site to choose. And so typically we bring together the hospitals and we bring together the dental providers and we talk about the possibility of doing, you know, doing a pilot and, and testing out this model. Um, we, we have resources to provide to you. What, what's happening here is that unlike any other community that we've reached out to, you already have these existing partnerships. We're taking advantage of this group that already exists, but our first step is always to get the buy-in from the hospitals. If the hospitals feel you know, that this is something that would be helpful and we adapt it accordingly, we know we've looked at the numbers that all of you have and we know that there's, you know, there's quite a few numbers of people that are showing up at your hospital. And so typically after we get the buy-in, we then go to the next step where we bring partners together. And it's all the partners that are sitting at the table, also public health. And like Russ mentioned, he wants to get some of the, pri the private dentists involved. And then we share the clinical algorithm as Russ did. And you all look at that and decide how you want to adapt that to work within your community. We have had conversations with NEW. And so we also, along with all of you, have to develop a referral mechanism that works for all of you. And so that's another step that has to happen. The other step that has to happen is the training takes place. And Beth, you were asking about that. And we usually set that up with each, with each healthcare organization, whatever works for you. So there's, there's, um, so that those are the steps. And then once, once we, well, first of all, once we get the buy-in, but once we, you know, you've had a chance to take a look at the clinical algorithm, 
we we have a referral mechanism that's explored and and shared with all of you to determine the way to go and the training takes place then we bring everybody back together again and make sure that everybody's on the same page and then typically that's at the point what we when we launch it so that's the process that we've been using but in in this case you're already way ahead of the game because you've been doing this for years and you've had these partnerships for years. We just want to be able to support you, give you the resources that you need. We'll be providing cards that you can give to the patients that, you know, links them up to NEW so that they have a number to call. Um, so all of that, you know, the training and the resources and helping you if you're going to do an epic, you know, um, you're going to set something up with Epic. We have the resources to help you out. So um, it isn't a question. So I, when Michael, when you said, how do we get started? We're, you know, we're already here to give you the resources. We just, you know, want to find out whether you're interested and you have oral health partnership and NEW is incredible resources already. And we want to assist by helping get the private dentists involved as well. And I know that happens to some extent already in the Green Bay area, but we want to assist with that. Thank you, Lisa, for that clarification. I think that's really helpful. And you're right, we have tremendous resources in this community. Um, prior to my time on this coalition, I know there was great work done and the amount of preventable dental visits in the ER went down significantly and has consistently tracked lower. Um, but I think the work that you're all doing or going to do uh, more purposefully will just be helpful, you know, connecting with those hospitals. Please use this group however you'd like. I can certainly email out. We have a good number of dentists who will also, if you have a call to action of sorts, you know, we'll make sure they hear that at least through email. Um, and then I wanted to address, so Lynn um, Kettenhoffen asked the question, how many private dental practitioners in the Green Bay area does Northeast Wisconsin have on board as they coordinate care? Um, I'll mention that during our uh, dental reimbursement pilot, we had the most private dentists sign up of any group to see patients on Medicaid, uh, whether or not they took a lot of Medicaid patients. Um, and so, you know, Lynn, is your question for the people presenting today or anyone who knows the answer? <laughs> or Kim, specifically. Yeah, so NEW, um, so if we're defining NEW as NEW Community Clinic versus Northeast Wisconsin. Oh, yeah, I read that wrong. Yeah, so Kayla, um, I saw she came off mute. She's really spearheading um, a lot of these efforts with Lisa um, and, and putting the plan together. Right now, I don't know that we have a list or I have a number of all of the dental practitioners here in Green Bay area. And are they on board? Not yet. As Dr. Dunkel said, um, that's really kind of one of the next steps in the project um, process of this project is continuing to create awareness and such. And I'll let Kayla um, speak to maybe some work that she's done. No, thank you. I think Lisa really laid out um, the framework. The next step is really to engage all of you guys with the hospital systems to figure out what best would work for the referral process, kind of learning what you guys are already doing um, and then building it off of them. Um, like Kim had said, we don't have any of those private dentists yet. It's really kind of backing up and starting off with that referral process and starting from the very beginning. So referrals, the training for the docs um, and the ER staff, and then really moving forward, um, bringing on a new team member for that care coordination position um, to really support that initiative. So Michael, I'll be looking to you and this group to kind of help with some of that and learn what the organizations currently do and then leveraging um, some of the great partnerships that you already have in place to help with that. Great, great work. Uh, yes, we have some dentists who I think will say, all right, um, I'll be part of it uh, through this group or otherwise. And um, just because we're coming up upon our time, Bobby, Lisa, Dr. Dunkel, thank you three so much for spending your time with us and with other communities. We exist, this coalition specifically, to do the type of work you're talking about. So phenomenal work. Um, and I just see things improving and getting better for our residents who need the care. So 
Um, thank you all for joining the call today and uh, please feel free to email me if you have any other questions. And thanks for everybody for allowing us to present today. Really appreciate it. Thanks all. Likewise, bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good one, everybody.